dear participants, we will start the webinar immediately. Request all the participants to mute your audio. Dear participants, uh, in the people tab, you can see the you can see the user named uh, Steve Lockett. Uh, uh, Mr. Steve Lockett is a uh, presenter for today's webinar. And I request everyone to pin uh, the user named Steve Lockett so that you could see uh, the presentation as well as Mr. Steve uh, during the presentation time. I request uh, all the participants to enter your name and uh, the name of your institute in the chat box. In the chat box, please enter your name and uh, your institution's name so that this will be treated as an attendance record and the certificate will be uh, issued on the basis of this attendance. I request everyone uh, to enter your name as well as your uh, institution's name. So at the end of the uh, webinar, we could get the, this as a, in a, a different text, uh, te as a text and we could uh, process this information later. And we had uh, nearly 90, uh, participants for the presentation, I mean, for the webinar. And uh, we had 90 registrations for the webinar and uh, now nearly 44 had joined. Uh, anyway, we had uh, shared eight minutes. We will wait for another two minutes. By 3.10, we will uh, start uh, the program. I request all the participants to introduce yourself, your name, followed by the institution's name. The webinar is co-hosted by uh, the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture and Dr. Ajit Thomas John, the head of the department, uh, has, I mean, he have joined the program. Uh, yeah, thank you, Shai. Oh, welcome, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Ajit Thomas John, head of the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture. It is lovely to see you, uh, Mr. C Steve Lockett. Uh, that's me. It's almost three ten. I believe that we should start the program. Yeah. Uh, dear students, please uh, request everyone to mute your audio and uh, please pin Mrs. Steve Lockett and uh, uh, please don't present it between and uh, the entire uh, webinar is being recorded. So uh, uh, repeat, uh, repeating the same thing uh, with regard to the attendance, uh, request everyone to introduce yourself, the name as well as your institution's name that will be treated as the attendance and uh, the certificates will be issued on the basis of the attendance record. How to my responsibility, Mr. Uh, Steve Lockett, uh, the guest of the day, uh, serves as the education and outreach officer of Masir, uh, Masir Trust UK. 
having uh, parallel careers in education and uh, music for 30 years. Uh, Mr. Steve uh, brings both knowledge and entertainment to his inspirational presentation. I believe in the next uh, one hour, we are going to enjoy his presentation anyway. Uh, he is involved with the key aspects of freshwater conservation in Asia for the last 20 years and has been a member of uh, uh, Masir Trust since 2011. Steve has involved uh, in a lot of responsibilities. Uh, previously, he held the pro role of the press officer and the vice chair, uh, acting chair from 15 to 17, and has been working on issues of river and fish conservation in the South and Southeast Asian countries for the last 20 years. In a voluntary capacity in UK for the 20 years prior to that, since standing down as a trustee of Masir Trust to spend more time in Masir Range countries, Steve has used his background in journalism and teaching to, to drive out outreach about the river conservation awareness. And uh, better community conservation incentives. His time studying Masir river habits and human use of freshwater habitat have included projects in Cambodia, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. Steve is architect of the Holistic Kaveri Mission Program for the Indian Ka River Kaveri, a wide ranging project supported by Tata Power involving scientific study, outreach, and local cultural heritage elements. This project aims to conserve critically endangered humpbacked masir Tor Ramadevi as an umbrella species to protect better overall river ecosystem, health, and associated water availability. I believe that uh, this is a, one of the best uh, speakers that we have, Mr. Uh, Steve Lockett, uh, who is into the conservation uh, uh, conservation uh, area, endangered conservation area. I believe that uh, the next uh, one hour will be very informative as well as it will give a wonderful insight to Masir uh, Fish. Uh, on behalf of the Albertian uh, Center for Human Resource Development and Research of St. Albert's College Autonomous, uh, I caught and uh, the co-host uh, Department of Fisheries and Research, uh, Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture and the Research uh, Department of St. Albert's College. I cordially welcome uh, Mr. Steve Lockett the Education and Outreach Officer of uh, Masir Trust to this uh, webinar. Hearty welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Anthony, sir. Good morning to you all from my uh, semi-permanent residency, which is by the side of the Mediterranean Sea in southern Spain. And a good afternoon to you all there. I imagine most of you, if not all of you, are resident in and around the beautiful city of Kochi which I first visited in 2001 and where we held a conference in 2017, a very successful conference. I'd just like to start by saying a few very brief words. Most importantly, a big thank you to my colleague, Dr. Rajiv Raghavan from KUFOS, Kerala University of Fisheries and Ocean Studies, who set up the entire uh, webinar and made the connection with St. Albert's. Rajiv is alumni of St. Albert's himself, and uh, he started his scientific career at St. Albert's College. And of course, a very special thank you to all of the staff of St. Albert's and the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture for making the arrangements and giving me this opportunity to share some thoughts with all of you. I will mainly be talking about Marcia. This is my area of special interest. I hope it does interest you, or if it doesn't currently interest you, that I can persuade you to be interested in Marcia fish. I'll also be making connections about wider freshwater biodiversity, and then also giving a little bit of information about how and why studies in freshwater biology can be used in the wider world, and also can be very important in helping what's currently being called climate change, but is increasingly being uh, switched to the term climate emergency. So I'll uh, just make a swap. This is my first time ever doing a remote presentation. Normally I can stare right into the eyes of the people I'm talking to. So it feels a little bit strange to me. And if I lose things halfway, please bear with me for a second. I'm gonna to try to swap screens 
and make sure that my PowerPoint is playing and you can still hear me. So, uh, Dr. Anthony, can you still hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yes. Okay, thank you. And if I go to full screen, you can still hear me now? Yes. Okay, very good. So here we have Marcias. And uh, these are huge fish. They're in the genus Tor. There are actually four related genus, uh, genera, I should say, that um, are commonly called Marcias, but the main ones are the, the Tor species. And they're fish which have been studied for 200 years plus. And unfortunately, quite a lot of what we still know about Marcia is from 200 Mr. year old. Mr. Steve, Mr. Steve, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, uh, dear participants, in case if you uh, if the presentation is not visible, uh, please search for the user named uh, Mr. Steve. I mean Steve, and uh, you can see two uh, names. One is Steve Lockett, and another is Steve Lockett presentation. Now you are requested to pin Steve Lockett presentation so that you could see the presentation. I could see the uh, presentation right now. So in case if you want to see the presentation, please pin steve locket presentation if you want to view mr steve click on the steve locket okay there are two users now uh, whenever he presents i mean whenever mr steve presents uh, there will be two users one is uh, named with uh, mr steve locket uh, within brackets presentation and another with uh, steve locket in the steve locket user you can see the video and uh, in the steve locket presentation you can see his presentation over to you sorry for the disturbance thank you Okay, thank you. So I hope everybody can see this illustration from 1817. And a beautiful illustration by a young Bengali lad called Haludar, who did all of the illustrations for Francis Hamilton's book, The Account of Fishes Found in the Ganges. And unfortunately, quite a lot of what we know about Marcia is still based on these 200 year old studies. A couple of quotes at the bottom of the page and Dr. Ralph Britz, who works at the Natural History Museum in London, he recently published a new set of illustrations from Hamilton's book. And he still believes that we can, as it says there, clearly distinguish species well enough from these illustrations. But the famous Indian ichthyologist, ichthyologist uh, Sundalal Hora in the 1940s said that he believes some of the descriptions in Hamilton's book are clearly defective. And unfortunately, these arguments over species identity in particular, we're still having those to the present day. It's a huge area of opportunity for study. And I feel, I don't know, I tried to find who said this quote initially, and I've never been able to find it out. So if anybody knows, or if anybody can find out, please tell me. But somebody at some point said, to be able to effectively conserve a species, we have to know what it is. And unfortunately with Marcias, we still don't accurately know what they all are. What I can tell you is that they qualify as megafauna. A megafauna, strictly speaking, means anything that is visible to the naked eye. But in biological conservation terms, people usually refer to animals that grow in excess of 40 kilos are megafauna. And India has two of the largest Marcia species in the world. The one on the screen here, Torpu Tutora, you can see the comparison with a human silhouette. And this fish is recorded as growing to 45 kilos. And the fish that was mentioned in my introduction, Tor Remadevii, a fish which is critically endangered. It's one of very few critically endangered freshwater fish in India. It's endemic to the River Carvery Basin, and that fish has been found in excess of 55 kilos. So these are huge fish, and we would hope that the size of the fish would draw people's attention to them. But unfortunately, we also have to bear in mind the size of India's rivers, which makes study of the fish very, very difficult. 
We do know that currently there are nine valid species in India. But again, if you look at this slide, I actually have photos of 12 fish, which morphologically are quite different from each other. Some of them look very similar, but we believe there are probably at least 12 species of Marsea in India. And the one in the center at the very bottom is quite important. I've been talking about this one this morning. This uh, blue looking fish is from Dibang River in Arunachal Pradesh. We only discovered this fish through taking photos of anglers catches two years ago. And this river is currently slated to go beneath a hydroelectric dam. And the uh, MOEFCC are bringing forward the clearance proposals now while the country is under lockdown and you can see there we have a fish we don't even know what it is it may not be tall but we suspect just from looking at this photo that it probably is a tall species unnamed species brand new undiscovered species potentially i should also give a quick mention you may have seen uh narendra modi's monkey bat uh, five weeks ago when he spoke about a brand new fish that had been discovered in the caves of Megalia, which again is probably a tor species. It's more than likely Tor putitora, which is a fish of Himalayan region. But we've not completed genetic studies yet. Dr. Rajiv is uh, involved in the genetic studies. So again, we could have a brand new species of tor, a brand new Marcia there. And until we send people out in the field looking at these things, we don't know the exact picture. But obviously the country is under huge developmental pressures, and this is something I'll talk about shortly as well. But if we look at biodiversity, <clears throat> here's a little graphic that I use when I'm doing outreach. And if anybody's feeling so inclined, perhaps you could have a go at matching the letters to the numbers. So A, B, C, D, E, F, and which of these animals fit into those particular letters. The biodiversity covers everything associated with an ecosystem. And although my particular interest is in fish, I feel it's very important that anybody studying fish should have a broad based knowledge of all of the various aspects of biodiversity that are associated with and more importantly, impacted by our study in fish. I work very closely with a group from Bangalore called Nityata River Otter Conservancy. When I first started talking to him, we had many jokes about the fact that his otters eat my fish. So we have a, a conservation competition there. But actually, we both agree that we're united by the fact that without one or the other of these species, our own conservation messages our own conservation priorities are changed because Mr. Steve, if there are <laughs> yes yeah i'm sorry uh, i okay. believe that you are changing the slides but uh, uh, we can uh, view only the first slide oh okay should i one second so i'm back on the screen yes should i switch to this is this better can you see the slide now it's a pencil sketch slide yes uh, we could i know that uh, it's difficult for you to uh, work with the full okay. screen mode but uh, can you give yes. it a try so that uh, uh, it will be more visible for the people okay you can use the left and right uh, arrow keys to move around so can you see this now yes but it's not in a full uh, screen view that is uh, okay. in case if you can move it to the presentation mode that will be and now oh uh, it's it's still the same as you have uh, yeah that that's okay i think uh, we should not waste the time i'm sorry uh, sorry okay so i'm in full screen mode now yeah you could go into the slideshow mode i'm in on my on my screen i'm in slide in the full screen 
on the slideshow. One second. So this is, so you can see the pencil sketch now? Yes. Yeah, we can see the sketch. Uh, okay. Yeah. Be fine. And now can you see it in full screen? Not yet. And now I've jumped back. Can you see the screen with 12 pictures of fish? No, we are seeing only the pencil sketch now. Only the pencil sketch, right. Yes. One second. Yeah, this is... Um... Is it face down, please? Yeah, this is only showing what appears to be a screenshot. I don't have any control over the presentation. So would it be better if, one second, um, and now we have to the screen and show number of pictures. Okay, this may be a bit clunky, but I'll jump backwards and forwards between there. So let me just recap briefly. Yeah. So now you have the opening page? Yes, correct. Okay. Now you have my second page talking about the history. Right, right, correct. Okay. <laughs> and my third page talking about megafauna? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And now the number of species? Yes, 12 species, correct. Okay. And now we're back to biodiversity. Okay. 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 Yes. So in terms of studying any particular fish, it's also important that we understand all of the elements of biodiversity and how they interconnect. The environment versus development. This is quite a huge issue at the moment, particularly within India. What very often happens is that people concentrate on one small element of what they're doing. So again, my request would be that people who are commencing on studies, that you try to see the bigger picture. Although you may be looking very specifically at fish, you have to keep in mind the impacts that your studies will have on bigger things. And if you look at this map, if you can see it clearly, this is looking at the entire Ganges River Basin. And this is a presentation by the World Bank. But unfortunately in the map, they've missed out Nepal, which is a very important part of the Ganges Basin. So quite quickly, quite clearly, we can see that you have to include everything in your considerations. But obviously our interest is fish. And here again, you can see an example of why these fish are called megafauna. This again is Torpu tutora here. And this uh, fish can grow to 40 kilos plus, 45 kilos. It's endangered on the IUCN red list. And again, we have a river here, which is a shared river between India and Nepal, and is also threatened by dams. And if we're keeping in mind the various uh, positives that rivers can bring to us as a whole, we may well feel that we need water for irrigation. We need uh, the kinetic energy from rivers to provide electricity through hydropower. But we also need to think about 
all of the wider things that rivers bring to us and not only in terms of the fish but also sediment transportation <clears throat> and uh, energy nutrient recycling all of these things are connected and they should all be considered when we're thinking about development and also we have to consider the people who live alongside the rivers I know that uh, the majority of you will be interested in fisheries and aquaculture but one thing that I've worked on quite a lot is uh, um, tribals in India and Dr Rajiv at KUFOS also authored a paper where we both talked about the fact that fisheries departments introducing fish to rivers under the Blue Revolution banner quite often introduce fish like Marcia that may not be suitable for the local people to eat. As a for instance, the tribal peoples here that I was studying, they're used to catching very small fish and in a very specific way. And if we introduce large fish to this river system, the tribals are not equipped to catch these fish. They're not used to eating these fish. They may not know how to cook these fish. So all of these things have to be considered it's very well for us to have the technology to do things, but it may not always be appropriate that we do those things because we haven't considered everything that's involved. So a quick look at some of the things, some of the work that we've done. And again, taking into uh, consideration that idea that you consider everything involved in what you're doing. So this is the meaning of the term holistic. So we've been taking messages out into schools and also lectures like I'm doing at the moment to you. And also then working with local people to understand how they live alongside their river and then helping them to better understand the changes that may be underway. So for instance, a fisheries department introducing fish, are the locals completely equipped to take advantage of that or will it disrupt the locals existing way of life? So we need to build local capacity. Then obviously another thing we need to look at is, are we stocking fish for conservation reasons or for food reasons? And if we're stocking them for conservation reasons, have we looked at the threats? Have we understood habitat issues? Because if you throw fish basically into rivers that are not capable of supporting them, the fish are not going to last for very long. So all of these things are interconnected questions. And you guys studying fish, possibly studying aquaculture, if you have an interest in all of these wider areas, you'll be better equipped to do your studies. And you'll do your studies in a better way. And then taking those messages up the chain as well. I've talked quite a lot about people alongside rivers in the communities, particularly those who are um, less able to represent themselves. But also we need to talk to the people at the top end of the scale, governmental, legislative. If you have understanding of fish, of fish biology or wider biodiversity, then you're better able to represent these people and to be able to discuss accurately the relevant issues when dealing with governmental departments. And this goes beyond governmental departments as well. So here we have the FAO from the United Nations and talking about management practices. And if you can see, I've highlighted some areas by circling them in red. <laughs> and looking at ecosystems, but we're talking about capture based fisheries there, fed aquaculture are two of the areas that they're suggesting are on the increase. So we have to be very careful that these are done in the correct way. And the work that I've been doing very often, most recently with Arunachal Pradesh Fisheries Department, 
where they're introducing the European common carp, Cyprinus carpio, into paddy fields. And I've been talking to them and suggesting two things. Number one, why not use Indian fish, not European fish? And number two, if you are introducing those European fish, you have to be sure that the biosecurity controls you have in place are very, very strict, well monitored and adhered to. It's quite common that uh, the, the faster breeding fish like European common carp and also in Indian fish, rohu and katla, they're often used in aquaculture because they're so fecund, but there are dangers in introducing them into places where they could easily escape into the wild. So more things to just keep in consideration. A little bit about some of the specific work that uh, Marseille Trust and partners have been doing. So here again is Tor Putitora, the Marseille of Himalaya, or one of five species of Marseille in Himalaya. I mentioned that a lot of what we know is based on 200 year old study. We've been doing some uh, telemetry with these fish. And one thing that we found is that these fish are natal homing fish, similar to salmon across most of the Northern Hemisphere, where these fish go back to the very same river in which they were born when it's their time to spawn. And there have been studies in salmon. There have also been studies in other cyprinids, as Marcia are a cyprinid species, a member of the wider carps. And in both of those cases, salmonids and the cyprinids, it's been discovered that by introducing hatchery-based stock, it disrupts the spawning behavior of wild fish. Another reason why we have to be very careful what we're doing with aquaculture. And while talking about spawning, anecdotally, Marcia spawn in the monsoon and they run from a main river channel into tributaries, small tributaries and side feeder streams to spawn. But we've noticed different spawning behavior in some species of Marcia. So if you read the classical literature about Marcia, you will be told Marcia spawn in the monsoon and by running into tributaries. Whereas I've seen myself in River Corvary, an introduced species of Marcia, Torkudri from Maharashtra, which spawns probably three times a year at least. I've seen those fish in spawning condition in January. And here we have in Himalaya, a different species of fish, which could be tor, tor which would be the fish which gives the entire genus its name, but we cannot accurately identify tor, tor at this moment in time. And here it is spawning during April in the main water channel. So once again, showing that we have the opportunity to discover different things about Marcia, the ecology of Marcia, Marcia in the wild. These are very important. And here we have a little bit of a comparison between on the left of the screen. These are the original descriptions of what was then called Cyprinus is now called Tor. So Tor Putitora, Tor Tor, Tor Mosul. And based on these, these are the descriptions from Hamilton's book, The Fishes of the Ganges. We still cannot accurately identify those three species. And then on the right, you can see a phylogenetic tree for tall species. So we're attempting to use both of these things now, morphology, taxonomy and genetics. But there's still huge areas of confusion between the various species. And this gives us a headache, yes, but also opportunity to do more study and hopefully to get things right. The pioneers of aquaculture are Tata Power, and particularly uh, Dr. Kulkarni, who began the process and recruited Dr. Ogle. Dr. Ogle has been the main person responsible 
uh, just check that you can see that screen, yes. Uh, Dr. Ogle is the main person responsible for driving the artificial breeding of Marsiers. <clears throat> they found it uh, possible to breed realistically Tor Putitora, Tor Kudri, and what may be one of four candidates to be Tor Tor. Unfortunately, as far as conservation is concerned, Tor Kudri has been used under the generic banner Marcia and introduced into lots of rivers which had other species of Marcia to the point where Tor Kudri now dominates those other species of Marcia. This is the situation in River Calvary with Tor Remedevii, and this is one of the major reasons why that fish is critically endangered. And in your own region, the western coastal region, possibly from Goa through coastal Karnataka and into Kerala, you have a species in west flowing rivers called Tor Malabaricus. And there have been many areas where Tor Malabaricus has been under threat. And to increase stocks, fisheries departments and conservation bodies have been supplied with Tor Kudri to replace the Tor Malabaricus. I'll also briefly mention Tor Putatora at Bimtal. Bimtal is a government establishment. Uh, it's also called the Coldwater Fisheries Research. And Bimtal itself is an interesting conservation study because Tor Putatora were introduced into that lake between 1850 and 1870. They were introduced as an angling resource to encourage uh, Britishers in the colonial times to travel up into the hills and go fishing for the Marcia. What they also noticed is a related species, a related genus called Nazaritor chelinoides, which we would term a lesser Marcia. The stocks of that fish began to decline and by 1880, Nazaritor chelinoides was wiped out in Bimtal. And although we cannot prove exclusively that this was due to stocking of Torpu Tutora. It's the only noticed major change in that lake habitat. So it seems highly likely. <laughs> the introduction of Torpu Tutora is highly likely to be the main culprit for the loss of Nazaritor chelinoides in Bimtal Lake. So here we have, in terms of uh, modern day taxonomy, there's a very quick and easy way of assessing what we think may be a tall species, which is to look at the head length as a ratio of the, uh, the total length. And usually the proportion will be approximately somewhere between one head uh, to 3.5 or up to four. A very, very closely related genus, which is Neolis achylus. The head will always fit in the ratio one to five. So you can quite quickly assess a tor from a Neolis achylus. And then also there's, there was a lot of confusion with an unrelated but still cyprinid genus called Hypsilobarbus. And this caused problems for conservation of the Corvary humpback marsia in particular for 50 years. But if you count the scales on the lateral line, most marsias have approximately 25 to 28 scales on the lateral line. So this is a way of doing almost fast taxonomy. And certainly you can do this by looking at photos of the fish as well. The Hypsilobarbus fish usually have something like 40 scales along the lateral line. Some of you, as you go deeper into fish and presumably into taxonomy, will be looking at some of these things and may find it very useful. And in terms of the impact, so I've spoken about the tall species of Himalaya. So these are the original three fish which were described by Hamilton. We have Tor Mosul and then we have Tor Pujitora and Tor Tor. This Tor Tor is not a Tor Tor from Himalaya. 
And one of the reasons it's so difficult to do work currently is that we have to cross-reference these with fish that we found in the type locality. Type locality is the place where this species was originally discovered. But unfortunately, particularly in the case of Tortor, the type locality, which is close to Darjeeling in West Bengal, it's almost impossible to find Marcia there now. So we have no reference point. So what we're calling Tortor is based on a guess, effectively. We can use some of the taxonomy. This is important, but we have three and possibly even four fish everywhere from the highest parts of the Himalayan region all the way down to southern Maharashtra, with, which are claimed to be called Tortor. And in many ways, they're quite similar with their taxonomic features. Morph morphologically, they're a little bit different. Genetically, some of them are the same and some of them are different. So it's still a bit of a nightmare and we need people to be working on the identity. And here is a paper which Dr. Rajiv was a co-author looking specifically at Tor Mosul, where he talked about the importance of the type locality and how the type locality was even reported wrongly or incorrectly for many, many years. And only through work with Dr. Ralph Britz, who I mentioned before from the Natural History Museum in London, and studying the historic texts and looking at the movement maps from Hamilton from the early 19th century, they managed to pin down the type locality of Tor Mosul is the river Kosi of Bihar, not the river Kosi from Uttarakhand. So the importance of biodiversity, I'll just go full screen for this for a second and hope you can see it more clearly. So we talk a lot about biodiversity and the importance of ecosystems, and we'll also talk about some of the climate change impacts. But if you can see the screen, biodiversity is responsible for several things. Not only does it protect the climate, it also gives us food and gives us medicines. <clears throat> so it's quite important that we protect biodiversity. If we lose things and we don't know what we've lost, these could include a potential superfood source. That may also be a food source on which uh, people like tribal communities are already relying upon, and we may remove that from them. So they lose the opportunity. Uh, they lose their major food resource, but also we lose the opportunity to use a food resource, which could be very important as the world's population continues to grow. Also, we may have the opportunity to find new drugs, which could be very important. They pretty much all come from biodiversity one way or another. They may nowadays be chemical or purely the result of chemistry, but the origins are in biodiversity. And of course, we have what we're currently all suffering, the impacts of a global virus pandemic. And I'm sure we've probably read the news reports and read papers as well, which suggests that as we chip away at the edges of habitats, ecosystems, not only are we losing biodiversity, we're also opening ourselves to novel pathogens. This is increasingly because humanity is getting too close to nature. So biodiversity is important, but also having the spaces in which biodiversity exists is important. And studying that biodiversity through a single species or a single family, or um, so if we're looking say at fish in particular, it's all a part of biodiversity and gives us opportunities. <laughs> And while we're talking about biodiversity, so here's WWF in their latest report, although this is uh, now eight years out of date, and hopefully you can see the importance of fish. So freshwater fish populations are crashing and crashing in an unprecedented scale. 
It's very nice to look at things like tigers or maybe red pandas, these things which are cute and cuddly. <laughs> Fish are not particularly cuddly, but hopefully everybody who's watching now has some little thing about fish in their hearts because freshwater fish in particular, and also especially the mega freshwater fish, fish that are even bigger than marsteer, fish like sturgeon, and we can have giant freshwater stingrays of which there are also uh, examples of species in India. So these bigger fish in particular are the ones primarily which are critically endangered. But overall, freshwater fish are declining very rapidly. If we're going to study them, the time to study them is now. We may lose lots of them. Another little graphic, which I'll, again, I'll put this full screen. I'll try to put it full screen. Uh, can't put it full screen. Uh, to give you a bit of information. And also, if you look at the photos, you can see there, this is a temple pool in uh, Uttara Kannada. And where there are huge concentrations of marsteer. So we have to question, is this actually a success for conservation, this use of aquaculture, or is it a threat to biodiversity? Because marsteer are a predatory fish. They are actually omnivorous, but they act as an apex predator in many of the rivers where they live. So we need to understand populations as well, the ratios of marsteers to other fish. So I'll go back to what I was talking about earlier, and saying, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was uh, talking about the relationships between various organisms inside an ecosystem. So in the same way, we can look at marsea fish versus other fish. Some of those fish will be prey for marsea. And also then biodiversity threat. It's not only uh, limited to fish. We also have to think about the larger picture of the food webs so i mentioned before marsea fish and otters but also the other things that marsea fish prey upon and the other things that prey upon marsea fish so food webs are important but also then while marsea are spawning they dig up gravels so they're a part of the sediment transfer process marsea eat fruit that drops in from bankside trees from riparian trees so they spread seeds as well. They're part of the vegetation process. So biodiversity is not quite as simple as just looking at fish. All of these things are interrelated and we need to keep this in mind. And then last year I was lucky enough to give a presentation to a college in Kathmandu. Uh, they were environmental science studies and spoke about some of the ways in which their studies can be useful in the real world. And if you can see the screen here, hopefully, uh, if you can't see it clearly, you can zoom in a little bit. So all of these things are interconnected and it comes back to that same thing that I've been saying over and over again, how connected we all are, whether our thing is looking at fish or our thing is looking at other areas of freshwater biodiversity and then spinning that out into process. All of these things are important and connected, which means that your studies can be used to inform all of these different areas. So whether we're looking at hydroelectric development, we're looking at how to develop communities or conservation, all of these things are connected. All of these things are areas where you can usefully use biological studies looking at specific uh, fauna. <clears throat> and only by working on these things carefully and taking into consideration all of these things do we understand how we can mitigate climate change by protecting river process, making sure river process is working correctly. Because the fresh water going into the sea is part of the climate control system. And of course, there's a lot of talk about deforestation and afforestation in India, particularly the compensatory afforestation. So if you can feed into that debate so that we can keep mature forests intact in India, because they mitigate climate as well. So all of these things are connected. And the specific instance I gave when I was giving a lecture in Kathmandu was about city development. Kathmandu, obviously, in 2015 suffered the earthquake 
and is still trying to rebuild. And I suggested that people who have a good understanding of freshwater process, however they've arrived at that, could be taking useful messages into the planning of the redevelopment. So for instance, the use of permeable pavements. So you can restore pavements in a city, but in a way that still allows groundwater recharge. And this is again, something that would be very useful in India because groundwater in India is being lost at an incredible rate. So all of these ways, all of these things rather, can be uh, useful to have input from people who are doing biological studies and particularly those who are looking at fish, who understand river process and understand the bigger picture. So if I had to leave you with any one thing, it is keep your minds open. Don't forget that the point of a scientist is to question, not to blindly accept things. So please, please, when you continue your studies, make sure that you do question things and you see the bigger picture. And I think that's probably all I have to say for now. Thank you very much for listening. Hello. Hello. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, my dear participant, there's a time for the discussion in case if you have any uh, doubts to clear or if you want to uh, share any of the points uh, for a further discussion, uh, you can, uh, this is the right time to discussion time, please. Yeah, happy to take questions if there are any questions. Um, this is Steve. Yes. Yeah, I had a uh, to ask you about. You know, uh, is regarding application methods. Uh, you know, these mercies they have been uh, identified as candidate species for aquaculture. Yes. And uh, how well developed is this area? I would say uh, marsea in aquaculture have been uh, have a forty year history. It was pioneered in India primarily, and as I mentioned before, Dr. Kulkarni and then Dr. Ogle, <coughs> excuse me, and they started uh, with backing from what is now called Tata Power. Uh, the hatchery, the main hatchery they developed is Lonavala near Pune, which I've visited a, a couple of times. What they found is that uh, Marsea are not necessarily an easy fish to rear in artificial culture. They're nowhere near as fecund as other cyprinids, as I mentioned during the presentation. They also found quite a few problems with mortality rate. And my colleague, Adrian Pinder from Bournemouth University, when we visited Lon Avila uh, the first time, we suggested one of the reasons is that Marseille are, are fish primarily of fast flowing, highly oxygenated streams. And as I mentioned, they operate as apex predators, although they are omnivorous. <clears throat> and in the early life stages, they are used to chasing and catching uh, diatoms. And um, as they grow, they will um, predate upon their own hatchlings. So they're cannibalistic. But the bottom line is they're used to chasing things. And very often in aquaculture, the, the fish hatchlings, the fingerlings, the fry, are fed on completely inert substances. And Adrian spotted that and said, look, if, if you find some way of uh, breeding, in simple terms, uh, aquatic macroinvertebrates, mm. then you can use these to feed and the marsea will at least begin to get used to chasing things to eat. And they did that the next time we visited, they said the mortality rate has gone from 75% to 50%. <laughs> so just that one very simple thing. Although there is a 40 year history of Marsea in aquaculture, clearly there's still a lot to learn. And also I should say at this point, uh, Tor Kudri have two weeks ago been moved from an endangered species on the IUCN red list, red list to least concern and under MOEFCC 
rules which uh, are in the Indian National Wildlife Action Plan, the only species that should be released into the wild are fish that have been red listed as endangered or critically endangered. So Tor Kudri, strictly speaking, under MOEFCC rules, should no longer be released into the wild. Obviously, that depends on your purpose for the aquaculture. Um, and then if we look at the critically endangered species, humpback marsia Torema devii, so far it seems to have been quite difficult to get that fish to reproduce in captivity. We're working on programs at the moment to try in-stream captivity in the Moyar River, where we know there are there's still one breeding population. So there's potential for taking aquaculture into the field rather than doing it in labs. And in conservation terms, that would be a huge step forward. In terms of the blue revolution and feeding people, I would say we still have those questions of, if you're trying to give a major protein source, why would you bother with Marcia when Rohu and Katla are far more fecund? And also then if we're talking in terms of conservation, we have to be very careful which species we introduce. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Uh, another area is, uh, you know, regarding uh, the hatcheries. Uh, are there yes. any hatcheries uh, set up down south in the Western Ghats, near the Western Ghats? Um, I don't know exactly. Uh, Rajiv Raghavan would probably be a better person to ask. The mm -hmm. only ones that I've visited myself are at Mangalore College of Fisheries, uh, mm -hmm. which used to be Dr. Uh, Basavaraja, but he's recently retired. So he was the person I dealt with uh, for the last 14, 15 years. So Mangalore College of Fisheries definitely have their own on site. And then also Karnataka Fisheries Department have a hatchery at Harangi, which is in Kog, Kodagu. Mm -hmm. Um, in Karnataka, where I visited there several times, and they breed Marcia in that hatchery. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. okay. One of the participants had asked a question uh, in the chat box. Okay. What is the best season for the Marcia fishing? <laughs> Okay, yeah, from Cushy. <laughs> um, interesting question. So I would say, historically, the fishing has been done in the dry season. So probably, obviously, this depends on where in the country we're talking about. If we talk about the south, and most of my experience, not exclusively, but most of my experience is inside the basin of River Corvary, Historically, people have said that the best season is the dry season. So we're talking probably February to April time. And around April then, uh, particularly in the hills, I don't know if you get it in uh, Kerala, but I guess you probably will. You get what in Karnataka are called the blossom showers in April, which can be absolutely torrential rain and can cause even a river the size of the Corvary. I've seen it rise a meter in 12 hours. Um, but yesterday I saw a booklet uh, which was produced in the 1930s where they were showing pictures of Marcia caught in the River Calvary near Mysore in August. So when the river was at its highest. But that has to be tempered by the fact that it was downstream of KRS Dam. So the river is still dependent upon water release from the dam. So the, the levels could be could have been just suitable and similar to dry season, even though it was August. I also see just prior to that, Kushi, you said, how can we collaborate and make sure that Marcias do not go extinct? So I would say uh, Marcia Trust, basically we operate as an information hub and we have strategic partners, Bournemouth University in the UK, KUFOS in India. We also work with uh, ISA, the Indian Institute of Science and Education Research in Pune, who do a lot of the genetics work. Wildlife Institute of India are working with us, WWF India. And if, so if we're talking strictly Indian uh, based ideas, 
How can we make sure they don't, they, uh, Marseilles don't go extinct? The big one is find ways to protect habitat because ultimately we're heading down the route of only having Marseilles in hatcheries or in zoos, museums. We need to keep Marseilles in the wild. Two reasons, one is we need to keep Marseilles in the wild for their biodiversity um, importance. But also if we're losing river habitats, which we are, I'm actually hosting a conference to discuss the virus impacts on Indian rivers tomorrow. Um, if we continue to lose Indian rivers at the rate at which we lose Indian rivers, it's a, it's a negative for all of us. And that includes people who are outside of India as well, because whether world leaders like it or not, we do live in a globally collective, connected world. And the, the um, example I give quite often is that, let's say, black pepper from Kerala, you want to sell that around the world. So the way you produce it, the impacts upon production that uh, river use could have impacts upon black pepper production, that impacts upon me buying black pepper here in Spain. So I am connected with your ecosystem, whether I'm in India or not, and people outside of India who have never visited India before are also impacted by what happens with Indian rivers and the, uh, the products, the commodities that you try to sell outside of India. I think hopefully that covers most of that question. I've just lost my chat box. <clears throat> Uh -huh. And more from Cushy. Let me just I'll come back to come back to you, Cushy. And it may be useful if there are lots and lots of questions. Perhaps you can ping me through social media or email me steve at marciatrust.org and I'll try to answer as many questions as I can in as much detail as I can. But I may lump them together, the answers, if that's OK. I'm just looking at. Uh, Aina here, I've heard about the role of Marcia in history, religion and culture. Marseille fishes have long afforded saintly status, God's fishes. So basically, <laughs> two things. The first one is, if you go back to the Vedas, you will have uh, hopefully know about the flood story where Manu, or mankind, was saved from the flood. And Matsya was the vehicle by which Manu was saved from the flood, the historic flood. And Matsya is usually seen as being a Marcia fish. So um, the story goes, as far as I remember, I haven't completely read the Vedas, maybe some of you have, um, that mankind was saved by a river fish, not a saltwater fish. And Matsya is usually referred to as being a Marcia. And this is one of the avatars of Vishnu. So again, we have that connection. And then also in Karnataka, which is where most of my experiences, as I mentioned before, and particularly in Kurg, in Kodagu district, uh, Marseille are called Devameen, so they're God's fish, as you rightly say. And Kodagu itself, probably in the Vedas, was referred to as um, Matsya, oh, words escape me, apologies. So it's basically the land of fishes and linked to the the origins of Carvery, the goddess Carvery, where she was visited by Vishnu and Vishnu helped to set up all of the uh, the scenario by which Carvery was first kept inside a Kamandala. So she was imprisoned in a pot and then one way or another, there are various uh, suggestions for how the pot was tipped over and this was the release of Carvery which is echoed in uh, Ganga being Shiva's locks that are released um, and all the, through all of this every time we see Matsya we can relate Matsya, connect Matsya to the idea of this is a Marcia fish that's doing all of these things and I would suggest that is the reason why Marcia are called God's fishes and we have this huge idea of religion and culture. And then a final one, if I could, I did some work, um, it's just by remote communication with Dr. Belcher, 
who is currently a professor at the University of Hawaii. And he did a lot of the excavation work in the Harappan civilization, uh, sorry, the Harappan the excavation of Harappan civilization, the Indus Valley civilization. And his speciality is the archeology span of fish bones. And I have used in other presentations while talking about the importance of Marcia and why Marcia are uh, mythical uh, religious state, have religious status. In all of the fish bones that have been discovered, there are all kinds of fish from huge catfish, um, including right up to Bagarius, gooch fish, which again are megafauna, the same as Marcia. They probably grow to twice the size of Marcia. We're talking 150 kilos for some Bagarius species. We know that there were and there are Marcia in those rivers where the Indus Valley civilization, uh, the cities and towns were built. And the people are catching and eating fish from Gooch all the way down to minute Danios, Rasbara, the Garas and Loaches, the same as tribal people still eat today. But in those fish bones in the midden pits where all of the the um, meal detritus is thrown there are no examples of marcia bones found in those archaeological deposits we can see because there are examples of catfish bones that the, the people of those times were experienced at catching huge fish and they were eating huge fish but they weren't eating marcia which raises the question in my head of why were they not eating Marcia, but they were eating every other fish that they caught? My suggestion is because Marcia was still in those days considered to be holy fish. And just like it, oh, now more questions from Cushy. Cushy, I'll have to hypophysation, I'll have to pass that on to somebody who's a scientist. My background is education and journalism, my education is music education. I may know quite a bit about the specifics of Marcia, but hypervisation, I don't know what the answer is to that question at the minute. Um, also, uh, Cushy there is mentioning chocolate Marcia. Chocolate Marcia is a Neolithicylus species. It's what we call the lesser Marcia. And on that point, I would say common names for Marcia can be very, very confusing. So chocolate Marcia. Also, copper Marcia is another one. The same species, chocolate marcia, which I believe is Neolithicylus hexasticus, um, is also sometimes called copper marcia. And Tormosol is also called copper marcia, which causes huge confusion when we're looking back at historical documents. And if people refer to copper marcia, we don't know. Are they talking about a tor species? Are they talking about Neolithicylus species? So the use of common names can be very confusing. Golden Marcia is another one. Torpu Tutora, the fish of Himalaya, which is now probably the majority, the dominant species of Himalaya, has historically been called Golden Marcia. But the humpback Marcia of River Carvery has also been referred to as Golden Marcia in historical documents. That's one of the reasons why we try to popularize the term humpback Marcia so that we can differentiate between Torema devii the endemic fish of the River Corvary, humpback marcia, and Torputitora, which is spread across the entire Himalayan range. So in the Indus, the Ganges, and the Brahmaputra basins, and that fish we tend to call golden marcia. Can't see, are there any more questions? Nothing cropping up that I can see. If anybody has any more questions then please feel free i've just added in the comment field my email address if anybody thinks of any questions for in future you can ping them across to me there and with that i think that's probably all we have time for uh, thank you, Mr. Steve. I request uh, Dr. Ajit Thomas John, the head of the Department of uh, Fisheries and Aquaculture and the Research Department of uh, St. Albert's College Autonomous, to conclude uh, the webinar.
concluding remarks sir please ajit sir are you there yes yeah please can you see me no your video is uh, your video is not visible sir yeah my video is on but uh, somehow we are seeing only the screen of the presentation yeah it's visible yeah as it come up so in case if uh, everyone pings then it's okay yeah it's visible sir for me it's visible okay it's visible please so uh this uh, steve locket in the beginning you said that uh, you are in the southern part of spain and uh, we are glad to know that you are safe from the corona scare yes sir yeah and we mean uh, we no, i just to say that i i actually left delhi very quickly and got back to my village in spain the on the day that spain announced its lockdown we've been in lockdown for uh five weeks now and we have a further two week extension announced yesterday but yes we're fine in a small village it's very difficult for anybody to come in and out of the village thank you for your thoughts uh coming to my concluding remarks it is very encouraging to know that uh, a highly renowned and committed conservationist like mr steve locket representing the mahasis trust of uk is engaged in the conservation and rehabilitation of mahasir in different parts of the subcontinent all of us have been listening to a very informative session on the opportunities of the study of mahasir fish and applications of biodiversity study for wider development and climate change adaptation this is steve has gone through the session with ease and i congratulate mr steve in making the session highly interesting and valuable for us he has delved into such areas as important species of mahasi importance of the need to strike a balance uh, between environment and development then community impacts he has made a detailed note in recent studies on mahasi you know taxonomy and genetics of tor spoke on tor mosai tor potitora and tor tor and also the importance of biodiversity protection and biological studies now to sum up on this you know conservation of genetic diversity is very important for the sustainable exploitation of any species as we all know and we we know that uh, one species of mahasi that is tor ramadavi ramadavi a humpback mahasi uh, has been identified from the chinnar wildlife sanctuary pamba river of kerala by madhusudana kurup and radha krishnan in 2010 the detailed research on this species by uh, dr rajiv raghavan of the kerala university of fisheries and ocean studies and adrian pinder of the bournemouth university definitely it needs special mention in india the directorate of cold water fisheries research is engaged in effective conservation and propagation uh, to re rehabilitate the dwindling population of mahasi in the country the national bureau of fish genetic resources is playing an important role in the conservation of mahasi germplasm already six indian states have declared mahasi as their state fish and mahasi is being popularized as a potential aquaculture species as well as a species uh, with ecotourism potential in the country i am sure that uh, this webinar has been an eye opener to the more than uh, 50 plus participants who are uh, who have come here and on behalf of uh, the especially on behalf of the research department of fisheries and aquaculture st albert's college of economics and maglam and all the participants i wish mr steve lockett uh, the very best for his uh, future endeavors and i also appreciate the efforts taken by mr shine anthony director alpesh center for human resource development and research for organizing this uh, webinar thank you all thank you sir and i'll just finish by adding 
the one more species. Obviously, uh, Torema devii is hugely important because of its critically endangered status. And as you rightly said, it was originally described from Pamba River of Kerala, uh, which is part of the Corvary Basin. But also we know very little about Tor Malabaricus, the fish of the west flowing rivers of the, west, the southern western Ghats, which is also red listed as endangered. Don't forget Tor Malabaricus, and please let's do something about that fish in future. Thank you, St. Alberts. Thank you, the Department of Fisheries and Agriculture. And thank you, everybody who's been listening. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Steve. And uh, my dear participants, I just want to conclude uh, with uh, just a, a final word of thanks uh, to two important persons. One is Mr. Steve, and another is as uh, he introduced properly Dr. Rajiv Rakavan. Uh, Rajiv Raghavan and uh, I mean, Rajiv Raghavan is an alumni of St. Albert's College. Uh, he was an assistant professor in St. Albert's College. He was also into the teaching community of St. Albert's. And I believe that uh, uh, even after he left the college, he was in constant touch with the college during, especially during the last uh, uh, flood time. He and his wife, Ambli Rajiv, Rajiv and they were uh, together with us uh, to support the community. We were hosting somewhere around uh, uh, 700 plus families inside the college. The entire college was opened up for the uh, uh, flood affected people. And uh, Rajiv, uh, Dr. Rajiv, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Ambli Rajiv, uh, they both were there to support us in all the endeavors that we have organized. And further moving to uh, connecting uh, Mr. Steve and uh, Mercy, Mercy Trust, I believe that uh, uh, this will be a small step for the future endeavors where we can go further into the action oriented activities i believe so and uh, i believe that dr rajiv uh, uh, will be our uh, contact point and uh, uh, rajiv will be the right person to comment on these things anyway uh, we extend our full support as well as uh, uh, in case of need uh, we will be there for the supporting activities i believe that dr rajiv is a wonderful person that all the participants could follow because all comes under the fisheries uh, and aquaculture uh, stream. You all are into the fisheries and aquaculture stream. And uh, I believe in the South India itself, he is known as one of the best uh, conservator of the endangered species. And even uh, the team uh, there in the Alberts, including the Dr. Rajiv, have uh, Named a fish in name of Albert Alberts itself uh, in, in the name in the remembrance of Saint Albert's College, and on behalf of the management of Saint Albert's College Autonomous and on behalf of the Albertian Center for Human Resource Development and Research, I extend our sincere gratitude to Dr. Rajiv Raghavan to uh, for arranging a wonderful session like this and connecting us with uh, Malsirtras and with uh, Mr. Steve. Thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, our beloved. Uh, uh, Dr. Rajiv Raghavan, sir. And uh, over to uh, Mr. Steve, I don't know how to express our sincere gratitude to Mr. Steve. And uh, uh, when uh, Dr. Rajiv, sir, said about uh, uh, Mr. Steve will be the presenter for the webinar, uh, I was uh, keen, to, keen to him that uh, whether uh, he will be the right person. And Dr. Rajiv said, he, this is the right person if you are talking about the Mercer. <laughs> Mercer. And I believe that, uh, uh, and he further shared that uh, uh, Mr. Shi will be the one who can provide the practical information of things. And he have a wonderful experience on the Mercer uh, uh, activities, Mercer related activities. And uh, it's a wonderful knowledge that it's been removed from the red list, at least uh, as of now it's been removed. And on behalf of the Saint management of St. Albert's College and uh, 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 the, all the participants over here, and especially on behalf of the co-host uh, research department of fisheries and aquaculture, I extend our sincere thanks to the wonderful presenter, uh, Mrs. Steve. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank and, you. To, and to my dear participants, uh, without you all, nothing is going to happen here in the webinar, uh, maybe. We, some people uh, from the Department of Aquaculture, from the uh, Human Resource Development and Research and uh, Mr. C will be there. But uh, the thing uh, which made it more valuable is the participation of uh, the fisheries and aquaculture uh, interested ones, the one who loves uh, uh, the fisheries a lot and uh, who want to know about and explore about uh, Mercer. 
that's that's a wonderful uh, 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 act that you have done on today. So on behalf of uh, St. Albert's College Autonomous and on behalf of the Mercy Trust also, uh, I extend our sincere uh, uh, gratitude uh, for all the participants uh, who registered and participated from the beginning till uh, now. On behalf of uh, everyone, I extend our sincere gratitude to all the participants. Thank you very much. And just two uh, instructions. I'm sorry. Uh, before leaving the uh, webinar, Please ensure that the attendance is being recorded. Uh, your name followed by your institution's name. Thank you very much once again. Thank you all. Hope you have a good evening. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> good bye, Steve. Once you complete your attendance, uh, you could leave the uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 